I used to work in this really high end boutique when I was just, I think, 16 years old. And I was serving like really um, rich women. And I love the fact that they could just splurge and they didn't have any worries, you know? They pretty much just came shopping at 10 a.m. and dropped $2,000. And I was like, I want to be able to do that. Um, so then I started looking into like other jobs, first of all, because that job was not paying much. And then I got a job at the bank. And then again, at the bank, I was really fortunate because I was in a high end neighborhood. So all my clients were pretty well off. And I noticed that all of them invested. And I remember coming across like in everyone's profile had like these weird terms, like stocks and index funds. And I was like, I've never heard of that in my life, you know? And then I, I remember asking my coworker, like, what is that? Like, is this something we get once we like get a job or something? And then he explained to me what it was and I started looking into it myself. And then I stopped, I started investing in the stock market. And were you mostly just kind of conversating with coworkers or did you take that conversation, you know, being 16, did you take that conversation home and kind of bounce it off your parents? Yeah. So, um, my parents didn't go to college. They barely did high school. So when I brought up the term, the stock market, they were like, oh yeah, that's just something people do to like gamble. So I was like, what? Like, I don't think that's gambling because these people are making a lot of money. So I did bring it up to them, but they were just not, they were just not like entertaining the conversation. And so for someone like that, who discovers this whole world of investing in stocks at 16, that's quite a bit earlier than most people. What did school look like for you? Because I remember for me, like when I learned about entrepreneurship and investing and all this stuff, like I became kind of unmotivated, quite honestly. So I'm curious, like, especially as a high schooler, what that looked like for you. Yeah. So basically when I was between the ages of 16 and 18, that's when I learned about investing, but I didn't know what it was. And then I got my job at the bank at 18 and that's when I started investing. But I didn't think much of it just because nobody knew what it was and nobody was explaining it to me. So whenever I would bring it up, the conversation would just get shut down. So I was like, okay, well, if I don't read books or learn myself, then I'm not going to be able to learn it. And I was a big fan, and I still am today, of Shark Tank. And I remember they would always kind of talk about valuation and all that. So I kind of started trying to like research these terms. And then at the end of the day, it's, it becomes easier to understand anything when you know the terminologies, like share and value and all that. So when you, I started educating myself and then one thing kind of led to another. And when you actually started investing, I can imagine, or at least, you know, for a lot of people, it's intimidating, but I don't know if it's, you had all these experiences where you're seeing people who did so well that you just believed thoroughly, like this is going to work. Or did you have some reservations you had to get over? I thought I was going to become rich in a year. I was like, this is it for me. Like, I'm going to buy a stock and I'm going to make a lot of money. That that was my thought at first. But then um, that wasn't the thought. That, that's how it happened. <laughs> but I remember actually I was still working. I've worked at bank for like about a year, year and a half. And I would always bring it up to my clients. Like, when did you start investing? And this and that. They would always tell me, be patient. Just don't do anything. Just invest and be patient. And that's that. And I just kind of held on to that thought. So I'm going to quote one of the most trusted sources for quotes, Twitter, your pinned tweet. <laughs> I really want to hug my 18 year old self. Sometimes I was so worried about how my life is going to turn out because I hated school. Talk to me about that for a second. I always <laughs> hated school. Like I was, I always just wanted to cry. Like when I was a kid, my mom told me that she would drop me off to school and I would just, cry like I just didn't want to be there so that's one of the reasons that I always worked and try to find a job because I was like school is just not for me and so when I was 18 we have this thing in Quebec I'm from Quebec where after high school we finish high school at 17 and then from the ages of 17 to 19 we go to CJEP and those two years you pretty much take to kind of figure out what you want to do in life and I was at that stage when I was 18 and I was like what am I going to do with my life like I don't want to, I don't want to be an engineer. I don't want to go into like medicine. I, I can't even study medicine. Like it's just not for me. So I remember just being so lost at that moment. And I just really felt like I wasn't going anywhere. And did it cross your mind, you know, this, this new passion you'd started finding with finance to go into that, to become, you know, like to work on a wall street tap or, you know, to work with an investment firm. Um, so I thought I wanted to work in private banking or wealth management, but then when I started investing on my own, I just felt like if I was going to do that for other people, I might not like it. 
So that's why I decided not to study finance or accounting and learn something completely different that I wouldn't be able to learn on my own. Something that I think is interesting about your approach and which is a reason why I wanted you to come on the show because there are a lot of people that are just like buy risky stocks, buy meme coins, buy all these altcoins and crypto. It's kind of like really high risk, high reward bets, but you have like a really level headed approach where you're like, Hey, you know, I'm investing in some of these individual stocks. I'm investing, investing in these different cryptocurrencies, but I also see the value in index funds. So I would love if you could talk a little bit about your experience. It sounds like when you kind of started getting into this whole investing thing, a lot of it was those individual stocks. It wasn't just you were pouring all of your money into, you know, VTSAX, for example, or whatever the Canadian equivalent is. Yeah, I mean, I work hard for my money. I don't just want to put my money. Essentially, I'm giving my money away to these people or company that I have no idea. So I thought it would be fair to kind of look into more safer stocks or safer companies. And I was never interested in anything risky. I was like, why would I potentially want to put myself in a situation where I lose my hard earned dollars? You know, money doesn't grow on trees. Like I have to physically go to work for that. So I basically first started off, people told me to invest in index funds, but I never understood that. It took me a long time to actually understand it. So I took a different approach and I invested in individual stocks first, which I feel like people will usually invest in funds first, but I just, found out the term blue chip stocks. And that's when I was like, okay, this is where I'm headed. This is where I'm going to put some of my money and see what happens. And when you're thinking about, as you're trying to learn about finance, you know, 16, 17, 18, what is it do you think that people could do to, to reach those kind of people? Cause most, most 16 to 18 year olds, you know, don't know anything about finance. Like what, what is a way that we could reach those people or what kind of messaging do you think they need to hear? Yeah, so I actually found my people when I was like 20, 21 because of TikTok. Like that's where I started my account. And, you know, I found other people that are my age and know about these things and invest. And I think with the power of social media now, we don't just have have to go to friends or classmates or family. We can find people online. And I think that that's pretty much the best place to go because there's essentially no judgments because we don't know each other. So if you tell me that I invested in something that just is going to go nowhere, I'm not going to take it apart. But if it was my friend or family, then I would be a little bit more, you know, defensive or anything. So I think social media, honestly, is like the best place for these kind of things. And as someone who is so prolific on social media, you have a huge following on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube as well. What are the types of strategies that you're using personally to, you know, get new people into your platform, into your ecosystem? I just try to spread as much valuable information out there. I try to make my content educational. I want people to leave my platform learning something, not just being entertained. Just because I do think that there's so many entertainers, I want to kind of provide a different approach. And I honestly just have so much to say about this topic that it's like fun for me to also film and just like talk about it. So I think if anyone is trying to like grow their social media, I think the best approach right now is to share value or make educational content. If there's some people listening to this who haven't seen you on social media, walk us through some of the type content that you're showing some examples of what it is that people may learn if they come to your pages. Yeah, I usually talk about real life situations in my business. So, you know, some mistakes that I made, some good things that I did, or I'm going to share more um, personal finance tips. So um, one of the things that I actually spoke about not too long ago is how I maxed out my credit cards in order to order my to start my business. And a lot of people were against it. And I said, absolutely, that's not the way to go. But I took this risk and I was able to build something. I'm not saying everybody should go and max out the credit cards and start a business, but I'm trying to give them a real life approach that I did that. And I eventually rebuilt my credit with a plan. So I really try to give not just basic personal finance tips, but also things that I went through so I can kind of share my mistakes along the way. So I definitely want to dig into that a little bit, just starting that business, maxing out their credit cards. And, you know, when I read into your story and learned about you, you opened a grocery store and a restaurant when you were 21. Is that correct? Yes. So <laughs> essentially this was, <laughs> it's, not, it's not as simple as it sounds actually. <laughs> so basically um, it was COVID. It was like, 
I believe October or September when I found the place and the owner was just not doing very well. You know, his health was not good. The business was not going well. And I said, how much would you sell me this place for? And he gave me an X amount. And I was like, well, you know what? I can afford this, but I'd have to pretty much take out some money from my credit cards. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to see what happens. I'm 21. It's okay. It's going to be okay. So basically I took over the store and there was like this commercial kitchen that just happened to be there. And I didn't do anything about it for like the first few months. I was like, why don't I put it to use? And that's when we started making just some simple things here and there. And the demand just increased. So we expanded eventually to like a full menu. And walk us through that transaction. So, you know, how much did you have to put on your credit cards? What were they looking to, um, to get for the place? And what made you decide that that is a good purchase? So I had in total, like in my bank account, including my investments and everything, $50,000 at the time. And $50,000 is a lot of money, but honestly, it's nothing for this kind of business. Like that's like peanuts. And so I knew the risk I was getting myself into, but I was like, like I said before, it's just kind of a now or never. Like if I go bankrupt and what, you know, I'm 21, I have time to kind of, you know, fix it. So I was, I pretty much put everything into it or almost everything. And then throughout the process, it didn't go according to my plan. And that's when I started maxing out my credit cards, but I didn't have a choice. I mean, I had bills to pay. I had employees. How am I going to pay rent if I don't have any income coming in? So it was really scary at first. I'm not going to lie, like a lot of sleepless nights and all that, but it worked and I'm really happy I did it. And now it's been almost a year and a half. And from a mental standpoint, I mean, I just can't even imagine 21 year old, you're a junior in college or university, I suppose. Where do you get the confidence to go and just buy a grocery store? You have employees, you have payroll, you're going to manage the produce and all the other items. Like I literally can't even wrap my head around it. And I own multiple businesses. It just seems like such a huge undertaking. Where did you, where did you get the courage and the strength to do that? Sometimes I fake it, you know, sometimes <laughs> I just, I just fake it. There, there was days at the beginning where I was like crying, literally, I didn't know how to do anything. And I hired this like terrible accountant that pretty much costed me money. So everything doesn't go according to your plan. But the thing is like, when you're kind of stuck, you can't just like be like, okay, bye, I'm done. You know what I mean? You have to figure it out. So it's, it was just like me and my computer just going on Google and researching and yeah, I mean, I, I was confident, but at the same time, I was scared and I was sad at the beginning. It, it was just a very scary journey. When you purchased this, was there any kind of holdover from the previous owner where they kind of walked you through things, mentored you a little bit? I mean, even things like these are the suppliers we use. These are the days that, you know, they come and pick this up and drop this off, you know, any of that kind of thing. No, they did not care about <laughs> it at all. Like at all. They were like, here are the keys. You're on your own. They were actually in a really bad spot. And that's why everyone was telling me not to go for it. But I was like, no, like something's telling me like this is the right step for me. But no, he did not care. He just wanted to be out of there. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> and did you do any kind of ROI return on investment analysis on this? Like what was the reason why you bought a grocery store rather than, I don't know, opening a laundromat or buying some other type of brick and mortar business? So this goes back to one day when I was again at the bank and someone once told me that you're better off buying a business that has a proven concept and that you can get employees easily and run the place. And in my head, now I know that there's like laundry mats and there's car washes. There's so many types, but the only thing that came in mind at the time was grocery store. So I was like, you know what? I saved some money. Why not open a grocery store? Because once you hire employees, then you're pretty much good to go. Cause it's always the same thing. You always order the same things. You get the clients. Um, there's no customer service per se. It's a grocery store. Um, it was not that easy, but that was kind of my thought process is that I have this money. Why not make it, why not invest it into a business that I can kind of set it and move on with my other projects. And you said the purchase was $50,000, correct? Yes. And so I always love like helping the listeners kind of visualize this. How big is this grocery store? I mean, $50,000 doesn't sound like much for a piece of, you know, property that is, you know, is commercial. Yeah, it was 1,700 square foot. 
And essentially, because I didn't buy the business itself, I bought the appliances. It came up to about, it was actually worth way more than 50,000, but I was kind of just like, take it or leave it, you know? But once that 50K was given to him, that's when I had little, I pretty much had nothing left. So there's so many more costs to it. I have to renovate, I have to get new shelving, I have to do this, that, I have to get like inspections done. Like there's other costs associated to that after just buying the appliances. So after you drop that initial 50K, you kind of go in, you assess the situation, maybe a few cry sessions after you're, you might think you're in over your head. What are some of those first value add things you should, you do? Because I'm sure there's some people in the audience who either are thinking about purchasing a brick and mortar business, maybe they've done it in the past and they're looking for ways to further improve that business. But I know that you're super analytical, Ritu. What were some of those first expenditures that you made to just, you know, up the value of the place? Yeah, so first of all, that place was not maintained properly, so I had to pretty much get some renovations done. Um, if you're lucky and the place was well maintained, you don't have to do that. But that was the first thing. The second thing is nothing was safe in that establishment. So things I paid for, which I unfortunately, this was my mistake 100%, I didn't really check. But he was kind of like, this is a package deal, take it or leave it, so I didn't have a choice anyway. But some of the shelvings and just some of the appliances he had were not had to be thrown out so this is my mistake that i didn't check that because this was like an additional cost but definitely make sure that everything in there is safe and it's you you can use it you know what i mean because i have to throw out some of the stuff and then if especially if it's a grocery store or a restaurant you want to make sure that the fridge is functioning the stove is functioning there's all these things that are proper like you're paying for it so it has to make sense i failed to do that so i hope whoever is listening kind of double checks everything. And you know, it's one thing to, to be analytical and to be able to handle the business side of it and like the inventory, but I'm assume this is the first time that you've also had to manage people. I'm kind of curious what that experience was like having people work for you, dealing with personnel issues, more of that kind of HR part of the job. Yeah, that was really, really, really hard. Like that was honestly a struggle, mainly because I'm so young and people kind of like they weren't they didn't they didn't really care about me you know they didn't really it's hard to respect someone that's like so young you know come in and your boss is 21 years old and i really felt that also i felt a little bit uncomfortable like having to tell these people but yeah at the beginning like i was disrespected a lot um and i kind of had to take it because i couldn't do this on my own so, and it was also COVID, so it's not like I can just hire people like easily, you know? Um, so at the beginning, it was really hard, but as long as you're nice and respectful and what you're asking makes sense, there shouldn't be a problem. But the thing is, I didn't know how to go about it. I didn't know how to go about asking people to do this. So it was just, it was just not a good experience the first few months, but eventually I learned how to better manage the staff. So despite some HR issues, was it profitable that first few months? So the first few months I was paying off aggressively all my debt because it was really bad. I mean, I maxed out all my credit cards and it became profitable, I believe, the seven month of business. So I was pretty fast, mainly because I had put more money down than I had used my credit cards, basically. And what were you looking at? You know, once once you're no longer focused on just paying off the debt... Now you're kind of even, you know, just from a, from a money coming in, money coming out from the business, not necessarily the debt that you had. What was that looking like? So my plan was to first aggressively pay down everything. But after that, I wanted to do my best to invest in machines just so I can cut down on the staff, just because it's a very labor intensive business. Obviously, you have to have people at all times and you have to have at least two to three employees. So that's a lot. So I made a plan on how I'm going to not take a penny for myself and just try to reinvest everything back into the business. And I bought a few machines. Some are in the process of being finalized because it did take a lot of time to save money for that. But that was like my step that this was kind of like the phase two of the business. While you do have the employees in there, you know, obviously they have salaries or they're getting paid hourly. What do profit margins look like? Like I don't even have a guess at what a 1700 square foot grocery store brings in every week. Is it 10,000? Is it 50,000? I, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So grocery stores come, 
have a profit margin of about 20 to 30 percent depending on the product where i make most of the money is from selling fish and meat the profit margins are much higher and we're able to pretty much get specific products that are not available in that area and that's where i make the most amount of money and the margins are slightly higher they're about 30 to 40 percent but they're also more expensive products and then the restaurant side or i like to say more as an eatery because it's not like people are sitting down there's no space for that um that is actually doing really 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 well thank god and um <laughs> and margins are also much higher when it comes to cooked meals like restaurant food and all that so you got a blend of profit margins you know say it's 30 20 percent maybe for the groceries and maybe 50 percent for the specialty meats and you know but what are the actual kind of numbers coming through what's what's your the, like the gross uh income it's really hard to say because it really fluctuates like every single month sometimes it decreases sometimes it increases and it's really hard to say because a grocery store is a grocery store like people don't come in for like an exciting product the, the following week you know <laughs> so it just kind of fluctuates a lot and right now we're focusing more on the restaurant part of the business and also for the past two to three months i didn't have many of my high ticket items because of COVID and all that. We had like a lot of supply chain issues. We struggled a lot with inventory and all that. So the business has kind of been all over the place because of that, mainly because of supply chain issue and also because it's a new business. It sounds like though, all in all, you are happy with how the business is going. So I'm curious, as you are expanding your profit margins, investing in things like machinery to make the business even more profitable, what is your goal with the business profits right now? Is it to reinvest in the business? Is it to open another store? Is it to venture out into another business? Um, as of now, I don't want to open another one. That was the initial plan. But right now, I just feel like I need to have more of a focus in the business. Um, I decided that the first two years, I'm going to see where, what's more in demand. Like the restaurant just kind of came out of nowhere. But if that takes off way better than the grocery, then I might focus a little bit more. But because it's still so early on, I think I'm going to have to wait to kind of figure out where exactly I want to go with this. Well, I'm curious about, you know, you mentioned earlier you have some specialty foods and maybe some meats that other places don't get. It's allowed you to, you know, differentiate yourself, get people in the door. And I'm sure when they come for that, they're buying other things. What, what are these specialty things that you're offering that other people aren't? So <laughs> it's really funny because, um, okay, so I'm Bengali, where I'm from Calcutta, India, and we have very, very specific ethnic items. Like it could be specific fish, spe specific spices, and only I have that in that neighborhood. So even I can't pronounce some of the names just because I'm born and raised here. I didn't grow up with these items, but that's what has helped the most just because it's so specific. It's almost hard to find it anywhere else. So if you were to say the biggest obstacle to growth, to expanding, to making this business as profitable as possible, just for other people out there, because I'm sure a lot of people are just racking their brains like I am right now, just trying to wrap my head around opening a grocery store when I'm 21 and getting everything to run smoothly. What would you say that kind of biggest obstacle is? It's all these unplanned costs. Like one day your fridge just stops working and then you have to find someone to fix it or your machine breaks down, or your employee doesn't show up. Like these are all things that can happen very easily. I mean, it happened to me just last week. So I think the main thing that everyone should be able to do is be able to wear multiple hats. So if your employee doesn't come in, um, you're able to take over the job. Or if you're like, I can now fix a fridge. You know what I mean? It's like a few months ago, or I mean, two years ago, like I never even bought a fridge and I can fix one. You know, it's like all these things you have to be able to learn quick and also be able to adjust according to whatever happens. So I've played around a little bit with selling some food with my, with my, you know, I had a couple of events selling pizzas. And so, <laughs> you know, I've always loved the idea of having like a food truck or some kind of eatery, like you're talking about. I'm curious if for you, that was just like, just simply, Hey, we've got the kitchen. Let's make some money with it. It's going to be simple stuff. Or is that a little bit more of a passion of yours? Have you been trying to like design the menu and is that something you've taken more of an interest in? 
Yeah, I always wanted my own cafe one day. That was the goal. And that's why I feel like that place was kind of like made for me because it kind of just came out of nowhere and it let me experience. Um, it's not a cafe, but it let me experience, you know, making my own menu and dealing with that. And it was actually the idea of one of the people that's working in the store. Um, he was like, you know what, like sometimes the store is not busy. Maybe we could prepare some food in there. And I'm not a cook at all. So when I, when she brought up this idea, I was like, okay, we could try it, but it's all on you. So you're going to have to like deal with that because I can't help in that department at all. Um, so yeah, we started off slow and it was 100% her idea. And I have a lot of love for my staff in general, just because they always help me out and try to figure out these things. I can't take credit for everything because most of their ideas are so amazing. Like when it came to expanding the manual and just creating these new things. I'm curious about time management. So you said, you know, have to wear multiple hats. If an employee doesn't show up, like you're going in, you might have to fix the fridge. You might have to work in the deli, whatever the thing might be. But you're also, you're in your last year university. Like we're planning this interview around final exams. You're creating a ton of content on TikTok, on YouTube, on Instagram. How do you get it all done in a day? What does a typical day look like for you? Yeah, so <laughs> every day is different, but I always start with school just because I want to get the difficult things out of the way. And I always start with school. I go to the gym for about an hour, no more than that. I can't afford more than an hour in the day for that. And then after that, I'm going to go to either content creation where most of the time I'm going to batch my content. If anybody doesn't know what batching is, basically you film multiple videos or you create multiple posts in one day and I'm going to post it throughout the week or I'm going to go to work at the store. It's really either or, but to be completely honest, I don't really have any rest days and I don't think I'm going to have one until I graduate university. So you're obviously doing a great job with building this brand and this audience in you know the digital world and social media. I'm curious kind of how that translated at all, if, if any, with the grocery store, this, this brick and mortar business that I assume maybe had like a bad reputation. Like, you know, it sounded like the person wasn't taking care of it. It sounded like the business wasn't doing well. So I could imagine people have driven by this grocery store and already just kind of put it off in their mind because, you know, they've been in there before. They didn't have a good experience. How did you kind of let people know, hey, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's new management. This is a new place. Come check us out again. Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually changed the name and I basically changed the entire um, setting inside. So I, because I had the, the exact thought process is like how, why would people come back here? Um, they obviously kind of ignore the place, if anything. So basically um, where the cash was, I put it in another place where the fridge was, I kind of switched everything places just to kind of let them know that it's like a new place, a new management and all that. Um, the other thing that I should kind of, I don't want to say failed to do because I don't know if it was necessary. I didn't do any marketing for the business at all, like the first six months. Um, but when I posted on YouTube about my grocery store and all that, I actually had a lot of people from YouTube come. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. When the digital world meets the physical world. Yeah, it was, it was fun. In terms of content creation, how are you coming up with different ideas? You're doing keyword research on keyword research tools. You're just kind of doing things that seem interesting to you. I know you mentioned you kind of have a hybrid model where you'll kind of intertwine your life experiences with like just regular personal finance content. I'm just curious like how that, if you're doing it all in one day, obviously you have a game plan beforehand and it seems like you've done the research up front. Yeah, so I pretty much have a list. Every time I have an idea for something, I'll just write it down. Sometimes I get an idea like six in the morning, I'll still write it down. Um, but most of the ideas I get from my DMs. So a lot of people, they like message me, how can I do this? How can I do that? And I'm like, well, if this person's wondering, there's probably 10 other people. So most of my ideas do come from like my comment section and just my direct messages. And I'm curious about like your kind of the arc of your growth. You know, I see on TikTok, you have, what was it? 215,000 followers. But I know sometimes with TikTok things kind of, one thing can kind of go viral. Was Did you have a moment like that or was it more of a slow growth? And, and what was it, like, what was that first video that you made where you're like, okay, this is working? My first ever video that I believe went viral was actually not even something 
educational. It was just kind of a video that was saying like, you have to work hard to get to where you want to be in life, something along the lines of those. Um, for me though, I do want to say it wasn't a fast growth. It wasn't a slow growth. I had a lot of issues with being consistent also given the new business because I started TikTok right about when I started my new business. So it was really hard to post, but once I started being more consistent, that's when I noticed a, a faster growth. In terms of timeline, so you're building up the grocery store, you acquire it and you're 21 years old. You're kind of working on it throughout the, the whole next year and you're still working on it now. When was this digital thing going on? Like, when did you start really going hard on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube and building that digital audience? It was actually right at the same time when I started the grocery store. <laughs> um, That's crazy. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was around the same time. And I don't know. I think I just really like challenges. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> And you kind of, did you pick up all three kind of simultaneously? It wasn't like, okay, I'm going to do TikTok and then, oh, that's doing well. Let me move over to YouTube. Or were you, did you kind of pick them all three up at once? Um, I'm pretty sure I started YouTube much later and I had only one video. Um, I started focusing more on YouTube lately just because short form content is great, but you can't get the mo you can only get the basics in like a 15 30 second video i think a youtube video you can go more in depth and people can understand better so i do want to eventually also shift more to youtube just so i can understand things more clearly and with different social media platforms there's a difference in the quality of traffic like tiktok traffic is notoriously lower quality than say youtube traffic or blog traffic would be and i see you have all these products so you have like one-on-one -on -one coaching for investing for businesses. You have courses, you have the beginner's guide mm -hmm. to the stock market and you have a cryptocurrency course and you have basically an inside look at your portfolio. What's kind of the goal? What's the funnel strategy? Like how do you get people from those, you know, lower quality traffic platforms like a TikTok or like through Instagram reels, for example, how do you get them to then go and purchase your products and check you out there? Usually, um, like you said, TikTok has definitely lower quality audience. But the higher quality audience that's in that specific area, they usually transfer over to Instagram. And usually I think people that follow me on Instagram or follow creators like myself on Instagram, they're more willing to learn. You know, they want daily updates and stuff like that. So I do think that people, it's you can get more um, funnels on Instagram, first of all, but you can also create a, a, a bond with your followers on a platform like that. So I think when I, I talk about certain things, a lot of people have questions and every single thing that I come out with, whether it's coaching or a crypto guide or whatever it is that I have, it was all based on requests. So people ask me and I put it out. And I think that's one of the things why people probably like following me is because I try to deliver what they ask for. This question kind of circles back to when I asked earlier where it's, you know, how do we get through to a, to a younger audience about personal finance, which is not typically something that younger people think or care about or really get interested in. As you've started building out coursework and more material, have you had any lessons learned like where you thought that one way of conveying your message was a great way to do it? And then you realize, ah, actually, it doesn't work so well. And you had to kind of swap methods. Yeah. So when I started filming videos, I would just talk to my camera and just pretty much explain a concept. But those kind of videos didn't do very well. I mean, they did okay, but I feel like um, skits do really, really well and people prefer watching them. So that's why I transitioned my complete content from like just regular me filming videos to skits. And I feel like skits just do much better and people are more, um, people have been watching the video until the end versus when you just talk to a camera, people kind of just exited halfway into it. So real quick for people who aren't on TikTok or Instagram reels, what are skits? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> so skits are basically when two people, or in this case, it's me, we're kind of talking to each other. So it's like different outfits. Well, I take the time to change outfits. I know not everybody does that. Nobody has time for that. Um, but I do know that a lot of people, they basically, they take it to a whole other level. Like they're gonna have like different backgrounds and this and that, but it's basically, two people but it's again yourself that's kind of talking to each other yeah so it's like hey man how do i start investing it's like oh you go and sign up here oh i didn't <laughs> know you could do that yeah it's so easy um <laughs> something that you mentioned a couple sentences ago that i want to dig into because like 
you know, throughout the whole episode, you can tell you're super analytical. Like you don't just make decisions to make decisions. You you take the data and then you make data driven decisions. You're mentioning you're you were noticing that people were watching to the end of the video. So when you see that type of stuff, like how does that shift the future content that you're making? Is it just following the same format, like a skit, for example? Is it making more content on that specific subject? If you're seeing people that are watching it, like, you know, 45 seconds all the way through. Well, how I think of it is if people wouldn't watch the full video, but now they are, that means I'm on the right track. That means I'm finally doing something that they want more of. So I think the the, the best way to kind of go about you know, either shifting your strategy or starting something new is to really go with whatever the public wants. So if from next week people are like, oh, we're tired of the skits, we want you to just sit down and talk, then that's obviously what I'm going to do. Because for me, it's the goal is just to talk about business and finance. I don't really care how I do it as long as I get to do it. So I'm okay with changing strategies if that's what people want. And although I think, you know, at this point, Pretty much everybody knows what TikTok is. It's not this like just brand new thing anymore, but it's still something that not everyone really fully understands or, or understands how they should use it. Are there any tips like you give people who are maybe starting to get into TikTok who've only traditionally been on like Instagram? Hey, this is what's different about TikTok. This is what you this is what you need to do differently when you come over to this platform. I honestly think that TikTok is such a fun platform like you can literally do anything i saw someone go viral recently by teaching math problems like math stuff like i don't really know i'm not very good at math but i just saw them like teaching this and they have a huge audience so tiktok is just such a fun place you can do anything you want and there's an audience for anything like i don't think there is anything that's not in demand so I, I would say to just focus on finding a specific topic that you enjoy. And then from there, you just go about it how you want to go about it. And something you talk about on these platforms a lot, I alluded to it way earlier in this episode, but investing in individual stocks and also in cryptocurrency, I can tell you do your homework. Like you talk about it, you've researched it, you've, you've put in the time, you put in the hours. And a lot of people in this community are index funds or die. They are just like never invest in individual <laughs> stocks, never invest in crypto. And I think, you know, if, you can do it in small amounts. You can sometimes get outsized returns. So I'd love to kind of hear your research process and like how you go about, you know, finding new investments, vetting the investments, and then, you know, ultimately creating the content about how you pick them. Yeah, for sure. So I really like using different apps. Um, one of my favorite apps is actually Market Watch. You get a lot of um, information about how the overall stock market is doing. I feel like other platforms like Yahoo Finance, they focus um, pretty much about everything in general. But when you really find an app, there's also a website called Seeking Alpha. I don't visit it that often, but it focuses more on the market and how it's going. So I like to take a few minutes in the morning to read it. Um, it's not like the, the best part of my day, but I feel like the, mo the more I read more current news, the more informed decisions I'm going to make. So as long as you can find a platform that you are comfortable and that you want to read every single day, I think you're going to make better decisions when it comes to pretty much anything in life. And what about the crypto piece? Uh, what are you getting into? Is can you uh, maybe confirm my bias that Ethereum is is the next is, is the the end all be all? It's all going to Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, cryptocurrency is a little bit different in the sense that you know anyone can come out with a crypto. It you know. I've heard of so many scams. So I do tend to stay with like the bigger projects, like exactly Ethereum. Um, I don't try to focus on all these crazy little things that people come out with because like I said, anyone with a computer can come out with their own coin and make it seem like a legitimate business. Um, I think the best way to go about it is to kind of do your research on coin market cap, um, not research per se, but more kind of see um, what has been happening, what's the new coins listed on there, read their white paper, dig a little bit deeper on the team and the organization in general. Um, of course, if the coin was created by an ex-Google employee, it's much more credible than someone that has literally no background at all. So I think the most crucial thing when investing in cryptocurrency is to really look at the team and who came out with the project. And whether it's crypto or just highly volatile stocks, I'd love to hear your one, biggest win and two biggest loss. Yeah. So my <laughs> biggest win was Tesla. I bought my first Tesla share at $140. Um, 
And um, I eventually added more up $270. And that was probably the best thing I had ever done. And I remember I was watching TV with my mom and I told my mom, I'm putting $500 in Tesla. She was like, no, don't do it. You're going to lose your money. Um, and I mean, it's normal, you know, when, when someone didn't do something at first, they're going to scare, they're going to be scared, especially if it's their own daughter, but I didn't listen to my mom and I did it anyways. Um, that was the best investment that I made, the worst investment that I ever made. And I'm kind of sad to bring it up because it's a great business. It's just not, it's just not doing very well. And that was Alterix. Um, they're basically a software company and they're just. Yeah, no, it's just not doing very well. I took a loss on it. I accepted it and I moved on from it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And well, I, actually, before I ask a question, I just want to make sure, are there any other kind of things you want to talk about that we haven't covered real quick? Um, no, I think we covered a little bit of everything. And Cody, did you have anything? That's already... I, That's, I got all my notes covered. <laughs> all right. I just want to make sure. <clears throat> And Ritu, for people who are, you know, following along, I mean, you're obviously so early on in your journey and it's interesting to see what you're going to do with this restaurant. It's interesting to see what next individual stock you're going to go after. Where are the best places that people can follow along with your story? Yes, of course. So YouTube, uh, TikTok and Instagram, I'm very active on all three of those platforms. Um, and my username is the same across all platforms. It's at V2, the letter, I mean, not the letter, the number two, MZ. So R E E 2 MZ. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely link that up in the show notes so people don't have to remember the letter or the number. We'll just have all the links there. But just again, want to thank you so much for coming on. I know in addition to those social media platforms, you do have you know the courses that I alluded to. You have that one-on-one coaching for people who want to go the extra layer and want to you know pick your brain a little bit more. And yeah, just want to thank you again for coming on. Oh, thank you so much for having me, guys. It was great.